Thank you, Dr. Creech. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be in, uh, in Texas uh, tonight. Always nice to be here at SFA Gardens and always a treat to uh, come and see you all and all the great things that uh, you all have going on here. Um, we're going we're gonna to have some fun tonight. So this is going to be a little bit of comedy and a little bit of education and a little bit of horticulture. And I hope nobody gets mad at me, okay? Um, but we're going to talk about some practices that we do in horticulture that are not recommended. Or we're going to talk about some misinformation of horticulture that's out there. Or we're going to talk about some cultural practices that we do to plants that we should not be doing to plants. And at the same time, we're going to talk about some of the things that we should be doing. So hopefully this is going to be a fun ride and it's going to be a little bit of a vegetable information in here. And I guess how all this got started is the, the effort to eliminate the murder of crepe myrtles, okay? <laughs> so, and then when you started thinking about it, people mulch wrong, and people fertilize wrong, and people have these misconceptions about a lot of the cultural practices. And one of the things that's prolific these days is social media. Who is on social media? And who pays attention to social media? And so who sees the horticulture information that's on social media? And is it right or is it wrong? Right or wrong? It, a lot of it's wrong. Most people say just Google it. Well, Google, does Google know more about horticulture than David Creech or does, you know? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Okay. That truck is at Good Earth Garden Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. I just love that truck, okay? Let me get my handy dandy clicker to work. Okay, horticulture, I just wanna remind y'all what it is, how big of an industry we are, growing fruits, growing vegetables, growing ornamentals, growing turf grass, growing weeds, you know? So, horticulture, and agronomy feeds the world, and we also beautify the world. Okay, so who talks to their neighbors about gardening? <laughs> Only about 3% of information exchanged across the fence is correct, okay? So what happens that first day in February when we have a nice Saturday? Everybody goes out into their landscape or into the garden and starts working, and they start pruning the wrong plant the wrong way, or they start putting out their fertilizer on their lawn too soon, et cetera, et cetera. And one person starts doing it in the neighborhood, and that rest of the day, everybody is out there doing the same thing and following the leader, okay? Now, land-grant universities are 70 or 97% or accurate with their, this is actual survey that was done, so I don't know exactly how they did the survey. Now, we also need to think about we need to believe nothing that we hear and only half of what we see, okay? Okay, now, my dad, my dad was an agronomist, okay? My dad was an agronomist. So when I grew up, I could not say that word right there. Now, these are both four-letter words. <laughs> this is a good four-letter word, and this is a bad four-letter word. And once in a while, I accidentally say this word, and I think about my dad slapping me, okay? No, so anyway. So we need to think about how important soil is. Most of the media that we grow horticulture plants is is not actually soil. It's media, or it's bark, or it's peat moss, or it's perlite, or it's vermiculite, or it's compost, or it's one of those kind of materials. This is what we get under our fingernails, okay? That's what we sweep off the floor, okay. Okay, here's the definition of soil. Dynamic natural body composed of mineral and organic solids, gases, liquids, living organisms, which serve as a medium for plant growth, okay. During the flood last week, y'all got six inches of new silty, silty, sandy soil deposited in one of the gardens over here, uh-huh. Okay, vegetables. When do we plant our vegetables? We plant vegetables, Good Friday, Easter weekend. That's the old theory, right? So what's the earliest that Good Friday, Easter could be? March the 22nd. What's the latest it could be? April 25th. 
Well, if you wait till April 25th when you have Easter late, there's going to be people eating tomatoes before you plant your tomatoes. So, you know, this is maybe good some years, but we don't always need to be going by a specific holiday on the calendar, you know? Think about frost dates, freeze dates in your local areas. We're going to talk about blossom end rot. Y'all probably know what blossom end rot is on your tomato plants. Now, I'm going to talk about sex of bell peppers, okay? I didn't realize that was such a hot topic, but it is. Okay, now, did you know that if you plant your bell peppers next to your jalapeno peppers, your jalapeno peppers become mild and your bell peppers become hot? That's what some people think, but that's not correct. See, I'm telling y'all some stuff tonight, and you say, you're writing this down. No, 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 that's not correct, okay? Okay. Your Louisiana iris don't change color and become another variety. They get crowded out by another variety of iris or something like that happens, okay? Okay, tomatoes. Let's talk about tomatoes. I'm an ornamental person, but I like tomatoes if they have enough bacon on them, okay? <laughs> blossom end rot. Y'all know what blossom end rot is. What is this right here? That's a Tom's tablet, a Tom's tablet, okay? There's a recommendation to put a Tom's underneath the tomato plant in a planting hole every time you plant a tomato. We're going to talk about this more in just a minute. So blossom end rot, what are the facts about blossom end rot? Blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency that's brought on in the fruit because there's irregularities in the moisture in the soil, going from wet to dry, Calcium cannot be taken up. Sometimes there's enough calcium in the soil to overcome having blossom end rot, and sometimes there's not enough calcium. That's why you need to do a soil test and know how much calcium you have in your soil, how much phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, all these good things. And um, if you fertilize your tomatoes right at the beginning, you may not need to be treating for blossom end rot. You want to fertilize all your vegetables at planting with a balanced nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer. And then we want to side dress our tomatoes with calcium nitrate every three weeks after we plant. And you will avoid having blossom end rot. So those are some recommendations for tomato management, okay? Now, this is what the fiction is on blossom end rot, okay? Much more fiction than truth, okay? Now, my friend Gary Bachman at Mississippi State University, he figured out how much calcium is in one Tom's tablet. And he knows how much calcium one tomato plant needs per growing season. You need to put 243 Tom's tablets <laughs> in your planting hole for your tomatoes to satisfy a calcium requirement. Okay? So, we are one of 243 short, okay? Now, Epsom salt, people want to put Epsom salt on everything to cure everything. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, and blossom end rot doesn't have anything to do with magnesium. So Epsom salt does not take care of blossom end rot. Um, you, could, you can certainly put eggshells in your, in your planting hole or on your tomatoes, but you're going to have to have a whole lot of eggs, just like you need to have a whole lot of tums to come up with enough calcium. And the release of calcium from your eggshells is too slow to do enough good. Okay. One time I had 203 chickens, so I know about chickens, okay? okay. <laughs> coffee grounds. Well, coffee grounds can be a fertilizer. Some people, somebody said on Facebook the other day that I put coffee grounds out because it takes care of the weeds and you have fewer snails and slugs. I haven't found the justification for that yet, but anyway, that's what somebody said, so, and it's on Facebook, so it must be true. <laughs> powder, milk, baking soda. Uh, you can put fish heads out, and, and that, you know you, you do have beneficial organic fertilizer from fish heads and fish parts, but is it going to be enough? No. Banana peels, that doesn't take care of the blossom end right. Bone meal, that really is not going to do it either. So go back to that fertilization, go back to that calcium nitrate, okay? Are y'all mad yet? Okay, okay. <laughs> Gardener Special Fertilome, really good vegetable gardening fertilizer, many other fertilizers out there. Calcium nitrate, 
This works good on your bell peppers, on your eggplants, on your cucumbers, your melons, your, your uh, squash, all your cucurbits and all your solanaceae type plants really like that calcium nitrate three week side dress after planting all the way into the harvest season. Um, about a, about a, a teaspoon, two teaspoons per plant is really about all you need. Not a whole lot. Now if you want to kind of be organic in your, in your fertilizer on your tomatoes, uh, Espoma, good fertilizers. Keep in mind your organic fertilizers have less nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium in them than your synthetic or your other kind of fertilizer. So this is going to be giving you 2, 4, 6 percent nitrogen instead of 10 or 15 percent nitrogen. Uh, so really good organic products for fertilization of your vegetables right at the garden centers and feed stores these days. Okay, now here is the misinformation here on the bell peppers, okay? Look at your bell peppers and check their gender. <laughs> this, is, this is all over the internet, y'all. The ones that have four bumps, four bumps, now those are lobes, you know, and the ones, y'all are laughing, and the ones that have three bumps are male, so here's your female bell pepper, and here's your male bell pepper. Now, your female, your females have more seed in them, and you're, and sweeter, and you eat these raw, but your males are better for cooking. <laughs> have you heard of this, Dave? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So this is not correct. Okay, not correct. Okay. 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 Now a little bit of controversy here. GMO, genet genetically modified organism. Um, I can't remember if I have a slide here. Let me do this slide. Okay. Okay. A lot of people don't want to have GMO, and and that's perfectly understandable. You know, some of the agronomic crops have a Roundup resistant gene in them, or they have something else in them that makes them genetically modified, something that's not natural to that plant. So there are seven or eight vegetable varieties that are GMO. There's three sweet corns, but none of those sweet corns are available to home gardeners, okay? The squash has the most GMO vegetables, uh, and they are GMO because it's putting virus resistance into the varieties. There was one variety of Irish potato, but that's been discontinued, so there's no Irish potato GMOs. And there's one sugar beet that's a GMO sugar beet, but I don't like sugar beets, so that doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is the, the factuality on GMO vegetables. People promote that they have GMO free tomatoes. Well, there's no GMO tomato, okay? <laughs> the vegetable catalogs say, say G, 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 non-GMO seed. Well, none of them in the, you know, none of them are GMO. One of the big companies in the United States that sells blueberries, on their tag they say non-GMO variety. Well, no blueberries are GMO, okay? Have y'all paid attention? Whoops, I didn't put it in here. Have y'all paid attention to your orange juice? It says non-GMO. I was at Chick-fil-A the other morning, and I'm, I'm drinking my orange juice, and it says no GMO on the label, okay? All right. it, it's marketing, it's promotion, you know. Okay, pruning. I love talking about pruning. Pruning in the landscape. We have many horticultural disasters in pruning, okay? Okay. Chainsaws, pruning shears, this is all very dangerous, okay? We want to have a reason to prune. Dead, diseased, dying, decayed, damaged. Think about D's. D for dead, D for prune, you know. Um, we can prune to improve fruit production in our fruit trees. Uh, we can enhance our bark characteristics on our ornamental trees. Uh, we use pruning to thin a, uh, a tree or a shrub to make a better shape, make it structurally stronger. 
we want a thin instead of top. Thin from the interior instead of reduce the height by topping, you know. More plants are topped when they need to be thinned. We don't want to be topping, we need to be thinning. Okay. So, have y'all ever seen all the meatball hedges, you know? <laughs> the yopons. Just when they get some new growth on them, zoom, num, 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 num. All, all the new growth is cut off, okay. And then they grow six weeks and they all get cut off again, you know. You need to let your plants breathe, you know. When you get down in here, especially right here, you get to the point where there's not enough foliage there to photosynthesize. And this poor holly, or my, that's a pit of spore maybe, I'm not sure what it is. It's been pruned so much there's not enough growth on it foliage wise to do anything. It's all uh, stressed, it's nitrogen deficient, it's got dieback going in because it's been just hacked on so much, four, five, six times a year. So allow your plants to have a little bit of a natural growth pattern to them. If you need a formal hedge like a boxwood or something like that, you can maintain formal hedges, but you don't want to be cutting back into the old wood and you don't want to be pruning all the time. Okay, now, here we go. This is going to take about one hour on this, okay? <laughs> okay, the crepe myrtles, okay? Topping. Topping your crepe myrtle is wrong. And, but if you want to do it, that's okay. All right. Now, when you top a crepe myrtle, you're going to produce weaker wood. The new growth is going to be very weak. You're actually going to have fewer flowers. People think when you top your crepe myrtle, you have more flowers, but you actually have fewer flowers. University of Georgia did a study on this. They pruned Natchez crepe myrtles four different ways. They counted flowers over three years of different pruning techniques, and the ones that were topped always had le less flowers total than the ones that were thinned or the ones that were not pruned at all. Interesting. Uh, smaller flowers, they have a later blooming time. Usually when you severely top, they are going to put on so much new growth that it takes longer for those flower buds to come on, so they're going to bloom about two to three weeks later. You're going to have fewer pollinating insects. You know, people think crepe myrtles don't really have many insects out on them or pollinating things on them, but bees are on blossoms on crepe myrtles very regularly. Um, you're going to mess up the nice trunks. You're going to have more water sprouts and suckers. Y'all know suckers are down at the base of the plant. And think of a sucker on a tree as a water sprout in the canopy. You know, the same kind of thing you have down low, but just a sucker in the canopy, straight up vertical, upright growth is a, is a water sprout. Some trees are more prone to water sprouting than other trees are. Uh, have you ever been out there pruning a tree and you see a bird nesting in it or a bird nest in there? Well, when you top your trees, you're not going to have as much bird nesting going on. Fungal decay, Allen Wyndham, University of Tennessee, has great documentation of fungus getting in into trunks on crepe myrtles due to continuous topping every year. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, you have more harmful insects and you bring on more sooty mold and aphids when you top because you have all that succulent spring growth, softwood growth in the spring, and the aphids are more attracted to that fast growth flush. You're going to have more leaf spot potentially because you're affecting air circulation. And, uh, and so these are the wrong uh, toppings wrong and the ways that it's going to be a problem. Okay, now, so when you thin correctly, you want to stand back from your crepe myrtle and look at the branches that are competing in the middle, that are crossing. What can you do to see through the tree? What do you need to take out to have a view through the tree? That's what you want to have after you finish pruning your crepe myrtle tree. If they need to be pruned, you prune them in late winter. That's the best time. You can prune them earlier winter, but late winter is the best time, February. January into early March. A nicely thin tree is going to have stronger wood, more flowers, larger flowers, earlier flowering, more insects, nicer bark, 
less water sprouts, less suckers, more birds, less fungal decay, fewer insects, and less leaf spots. So, so those are the positives of thinning your crepe myrtle tree. Now, we get to look at the photos. Okay, so that is a crepe myrtle before you prune, and here's a crepe myrtle after you prune. So, you know, crepe myrtle is alive and well across the whole southeastern United States, okay? There, there's, you know, most, 90% 90, 90 of folks that prune a crepe myrtle tree are going to just cut this off right here, okay? They're not going to thin, they're going to top, okay? So, so there's, there's a Steve Bender with a chainsaw going to the crepe myrtle, okay? Here's somebody wanting to report a murder in the comic strip, okay? There's a beautiful trunk on a crepe myrtle in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. That's what we want on our crepe myrtle trees. Now, here, here's a, a freshly pruned tree, but look how sharp the blade was. Look how nice that cut is, okay? Now, this is in Loosetail, Mississippi. This was in May this year, okay? This was, this was done in early May. The plants were already leafing out, you know? This is in Loosetail, which is the nursery capital of Mississippi, and they're murdering their crepe myrtles. These crepe myrtles checked into the hotel, but they did not check out. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So anyway, restaurants, welcome centers, post offices, and hotels are the main sites of crepe murder, okay? Uh, here's, a, here's, here's a fast food restaurant, okay? This is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, okay? How many stubs are left up here? I counted 202. How, how much new messy growth is going to come out of that. Here, here are some crepe myrtles that have been maintained like this for 20 years at the Hampton Inn in Baton Rouge. And, you know, some people like it, some people don't. And, you know, it's kind of like a bonsai kind of maintenance in the landscape, but if you look closely in here, if you were standing there and looking in there, you're starting to see a whole lot of dead wood in there. So these are kind of rounded off three or four times a year. They do let them bloom, but they produce these little small pink flowers, and then when they just get going, they get whacked back again. Okay. So um, uh, kind of like a lollipop, you know. Now, this one, the Southern Living Crepe Murder Photo Contest of the Year a couple of years ago. This picture is, of course, in New Orleans, Louisiana. A lot of nice art down in New Orleans. My friend Taylor Williams took this picture, okay? So you have the nice limestone base down here, and then you have the lava rock. And then you, you, cut, you, <laughs> you cut your water trough barrel here, and you, and you put it around the base, and then you fill it up with more rocks. And then you just cut it back every year, okay? So they just need Mardi Gras beads on it and we'd be set. Okay, okay. All righty. Poor tree. It, it didn't do anything to deserve that, did it? But it won the contest. Okay. Now, <laughs> I, I don't think this plant is capable of producing new green growth out of that. Okay. How many years has that been done to get like that? The, you know, this is at the Welcome Station in Georgia. My friend Tom Johnson took this picture. You know, we, we all drive around and make U-turns to take pictures of improperly pruned crepe myrtles, you know. Most people think I turn around for the Waffle House, but it's to take a crepe myrtle photo. Okay. So here's Dr. Wyndham's pictures from Tennessee, and you can see the, all this dead wood in here where these crepe myrtles are pruned to the same spot every year You've got fungus in here, and the trees are actually dying back now. And then you have mushrooms coming up on the side. You know there's something going on. You've got bark split going on. So these trees aren't even hardly leafing out anymore, you know. They've been pruned back at the same spot every year for the last 15 years. 
And uh, so here's, here's another one right there. Okay. So anyway, we can, uh, we can do like Dave Creech and Greg Rant say, stop the crap and save the crepes. Okay. Now, now I know Dr. Creech has to severely prune his hybrid taxodium, okay? But this is at Middendorf's restaurant in Manchac, Louisiana, and these were ball cypers. <laughs> so, okay, I, I, I couldn't believe it. They had, they had been there 10 years, they were beautiful trees, and I don't know what they're doing, and I haven't been back to look at them, so. Now, here's Savannah Hollies at the Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel does a lot of improper horticultural practices. These are Savannah Hollies. Why would you do that to a Savannah Holly? If you don't like the plant, take it out, okay? And put something else in. Now this is also moving into the Chinese elms. This is, you know, lace bark elm, Chinese elm, drake elm. You know, these have been murdered in South Louisiana. And uh, I don't know why. Do y'all know why? I don't know why, okay. The great question. Okay, now, transitioning, transitioning over to weeds, okay, weeds, okay. There's the, uh, there's the anti-roundup movement, glyphosate herbicide, okay. People don't want to use glyphosate, and I understand that, and that's everybody's choice and decision. Um, so, the current thing is, Natural News promotes Weed Be Gone. Now, this is different than Weed Be Gone that ortho sells, okay? And this is vinegar and Epsom salt and, and dish soap. Normally, they say Dawn, but this says eco-friendly dish soap. But Dawn is usually the one that's recommended. Um, have y'all seen this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... I don't want to get y'all mad, but we don't need to be doing this. Okay. This is basically burn back. You know, it's, it's going to just burn the weed back to the ground, and it's going to come back up again from the roots. It may kill a young weed that's just getting going, that doesn't have a lot of root system down. People think vinegar is safe to use. Vinegar stays in the soil, has an adverse effect on earthworms and microbiology, microorganisms in the soil. People think glyphosate does that, but actually glyphosate is not active in the soil. You know, there, there's something called lethal dose 50. The amount of a product that it takes to cause cancer in laboratory animals. Basically, glyphosate and vinegar have the same lethal dose 50. So, you know, just trying to educate, okay? Um, Epsom salt. Epsom salt is good for plants, but in this case, I'm, nobody's ever explained to me why we're putting Epsom salt in the, in the weed concoction. So, so anyway, um, this, is, uh, this is one thing that a lot of folks are using now. People are calling their local garden center and wanting to buy vinegar and wanting to buy salt and wanting to buy Dawn. Seriously. Um, now, there are 20% vinegar formulations that are being sold now as a herbicide. So if you're going to use this, buy that formulation of vinegar instead of the 5% vinegar or the 7% vinegar that you use for whatever you use for. Okay? All right. So uh, what is in Dawn? Now we wash our dishes with Dawn, but we also use Dawn as a surfactant to help kill weeds. You know? But, it, but do we, have we ever read the label on Dawn? Okay. It has alkaline dimethylamine oxide. I don't know what all this stuff is. I should know. I've had chemistry and everything, but I don't. It has sodium lauryl sulfate. It has potassium carbonate, which bothers the skin and damages the environment. It has propyl acetate and octyl acetate. And it has the same LD50 as some herbicides do. So a lot of the chemicals 
that we use in our house to clean our house, to wash our dishes, to clean our bathroom, is more dangerous than some of the products that we use in our lawn that people are scared of. So just try to educate yourself on those kind of things. Okay. And, and you know, so here's a picture showing, you know, how you can quickly kill and edge with, the, uh, with that particular formulation. Uh, but the weeds are going to be back in a, in a couple weeks or so, you know. Now, this is going to be funny too. This picture is all over Facebook. You've got to take your time and read this to get the full comprehension of it. Did you know that cornmeal is birth control for weeds? Now, there is organic weed control products that have cornmeal, and it basically suffocates the weed. So there is logic to this, okay? Sprinkle it on your garden, and it will keep weed seed from germinating. That's really not true. It will smother young seedlings and growing into plants. Reminder, I need your help to stay in this social media post, so say something about this or it's gonna disappear from my news feed or your news feed. So people are just spending this out to, I don't know why they do it, okay? All right. Okay, so I thought I had more, okay. Okay, mulching, okay, mulching. We're gonna talk about mulching now. Now mulching is what we ought to be doing for weed control, okay? But there's a, a good way to mulch and a bad way to mulch. What are some of the mulches that do the best for weed suppression? Pine straw. Pine straw mulch suppresses weeds better than many other mulches do. Cedar mulch suppresses weeds better than some other mulches do. Pine bark does not suppress weeds as much as other mulches do because weed seed land on the top of pine bark when they're floating in the air and weed seed need light to germinate. So they just land on top of the pine bark and they don't work their way into the pine bark and they just germinate on top of the mulch. Whereas your weed seed flying through the air, landing on the top of pine straw, work settles down within the pine straw because the pine straw is fluffy and the pine straw blocks the light going to the weed seed so the weed seed never germinates. Does that make sense? So you want bedding plants, you want one to two inches of mulch on your bedding plants and perennials, three inches on your shrubs, and four inches on your trees. And you want to go out with your mulch and not go up with your mulch. Out instead of up. Don't put all your mulch around the, right around the base of the plant. Don't smother your lower stem. But mulch, uh, mulch in the spring, remulch in the fall, put new mulch on top of old mulch. Don't mulch too deep, though, because if you mulch too deep, you get some mold and water build up down deep in the bed and you don't want that to happen. So uh, conserve a soil moisture, uh, helps uh, prevent crusty soil surfaces, lets water penetrate through the top of the soil uh, there. Helps you maintain warmer temperatures in the wintertime, cooler temperatures in the summertime. Uh, it's gonna reduce your weed germination it's going to keep that fungus from splashing up from the ground up onto your plants. So that's a good benefit of mulch. You're going to have less coal damage. You're going to uh, reduce soil erosion. Uh, you're going to have uh, less soil compaction. And you're going to add aesthetic beauty to the landscape. So a lot of real positive benefits from mulching. Don't ever let your weeds get out of hand. You, you have to have a serious talk to yourself and say, Weeds, you are not going to beat me. I'm going to beat you, okay? Don't let your weeds go to seed. And go out there and do a little bit of hand, prune, hand pulling once a week or so. If you want to use a pre-emerge herbicide, use a pre-emerge herbicide. You know, if you just want to use mulch and hand, hand weeding, that's good too. Okay, so mulching improperly. This is kind of like pruning. There's a lot of improper mulching going on especially landscape companies. You would think landscape companies know how to mulch, but I really think they just mulch so they can get paid money for doing something when they don't need to be mulching. So um, mulching too much can uh, keep uh, oxygen away from the roots. It's going to kill the tissue and the plant that transports your, your water and your nutrients. Um, you're going to have more bacteria build up due to holding too much moisture. You're going to have heat build up around the trunk. You can influence the pH of your underlying soil. Uh, you're going to have microbials uh, uh, competing with the, 
the tree roots for nutrition. Have you ever seen rodents and stuff like that living in too much mulch or just rodents living in regular mulch? So that can happen. You got to be careful about using wood in your mulch. If you're, if you're mulching, don't have wood in your mulch because termites. You know, you all may not have as many termites as we have in South Louisiana, but a lot of the bark that people use in landscape beds today has wood in it in addition to bark in it. Try to just get the bark and don't have wood. Okay, nice pine straw bed of azaleas there at uh, the LSU Ag Center in Hammond. Now, this is the, the disaster mulch job that happened at the church in Denham Springs, Louisiana this spring, okay? I think they got paid by the amount of mulch that they used. And, and a lot of this, a lot of this um, red dyed mulch is just chopped up uh, wood pallets that's painted. That's all this is, okay? I seriously, I'm telling y'all, this mulch was 12 to 15 inches up this trunk. And then you have your roundup halo <laughs> between the turf and the mulch. This is like disaster. And, but look how uniform it is. Every single tree, all the way down the line. I mean, you know, man, my God. Now, this is, there was one crepe myrtle that was dead there, but they mulched it anyway just to <laughs> bring it back to life. Okay. okay. But, but look at all that mulch. and Y'all realize how hot that is in there now, how much moisture is in there up against that trunk? Uh, I went in there and actually talked to somebody, but I don't know if they did anything. I got to do another drive-by and see. At the same property, here's a, here's a mature water oak tree. Water oak trees grow for 40 years, and then they die for 40 years. Fast-growing problem tree once they get to 40 years old. So these trees actually don't look too bad. And they, they didn't have mulch around them, so the same people, they piled up mulch around the base of the water oak tree. They, they didn't need to do that, didn't need to do that. If you did do that, you don't want to have it around the trunk, you want to spread it all the way out here, okay? Now this is at a, uh, a hotel in Lake Charles. Hotel, man, hotels are horticulture disasters, y'all, okay. And it's hard to tell here, but this is a uh, evergreen blueberry, the Japanese blueberries. And uh, once again, there's like eight or 10 inches of mulch piled around the trunk on that, on that tree. Uh, totally bury the uh, liriope. <laughs> Can you even see the plants? Those poor plants and those abelias have no chance. There, was, there may have been something else in here, maybe some ground cover juniper, but they're not there anymore, okay? Okay. Now, they didn't even finish the job. They just left these kind of mounds here. You can see there's more mulch here that never did get spread because they put too much mulch in the bed, so they just left it, you know. People paid them to do this. And there you go. This is at the main entrance, you know, and uh, they just left that pile right there in the middle. Okay. Oh, my. Okay, so that's enough on the mulching. Okay. Now, insects, this is fun, this is fun. So, so who's good on entomology? Who knows they're good insects and who knows they're bad insects? And we all want to know about our pollinating insects and protecting our beneficial insects these days. So we need to know our insects. We need to know what our beneficial ones are and we need to know which insects are predators on other insects. And then we need to know about the aphids and the white flies and the scales and how to identify them and how to treat them and, and you know how they reproduce and all that kind of thing. You know every year in your garden, every year in your landscape, there's going to be a certain insect pest that gets on your daylilies at the same time every year, or it's going to get on your tomatoes at the same time every year, or it's going to get on your crepe myrtles at the same time every year, so you need to be thinking about that coming up, you know. Uh, how, how many Damaging insects do you want to have before you take corrective action? 
do you not care? And that's, that's okay, you know. Sometimes a beneficial population will kill a harmful population if you let it. Um, so know what your damage threshold is. Now, on your fungicide labels and on your insecticide labels, they'll give you a, a low rate and a high rate and uh, every seven days to every 14 days. You know, so the low rates are more preventive and your higher rates are a control. You know, so when you have the problem, you put out more on a more regular schedule. When you're trying to prevent the problem, you put out less on a less frequent schedule. So, but most of the time, you don't want to be spraying for insects unless you're trying to, unless you have a problem. You're doing more control spraying for insects. You're really not out there spraying for prevention in most of the situation. And then there are very good organic insecticides. Or organic insecticides uh, still need to be used just like synthetic insecticides. Know what you're spraying and, and, and know that you know, they, they are going to kill certain insects and not harm some other insects. So, so uh, think about that. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples of those. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. This is a crepe myrtle. Y'all know crepe myrtles. These are, this is aphids, and the black stuff is city mold. So you, so you know when you're under your pecan tree or you're under your crepe myrtle canopy and you feel moisture coming down on you, that's the aphids going to the bathroom. That's not your tree transpiring. <laughs> Did y'all realize that? Now you do? Okay. You ever get your, your hood on your car kind of sticky when you park under a tree? That's, that's your insects going to the bathroom, okay? That's not your tree weeping on your car, okay? So, but when you have, you know, this many insects that you're seeing sooty mold, you know, you probably need to be thinking about uh, doing something. Now, you probably have some lady beetles out here, but there's probably not enough lady beetles on the tree to take care of this much of a problem, you know. And also time of the year. If this is November, maybe no big deal, but if it's May, think how bad it's going to be by October. Y'all know aphids are born pregnant. They are. They're reproducing when they're born. Insects are very prolific reproducers. Mm -hmm. If you wait in your landscape till you got the second and third generation of white flies for the year to try to start controlling them, your back's up against the wall. If you catch them early, you can try to knock them out, but you know, so, uh, so really watch for that. Now, these do actually do work. You can use solo cups or you can use something similar. This, this does work. You can put something like this out in your vegetable garden, out in your landscape, and kind of use it to scout and to trap and to see what insects are out there. Now, some people say a blue solo cup, and some people say a red solo cup, and most people in the Rose Society use WD-40. Uh, but this here says Vaseline, but this does work. It's like a yellow sticky card. You know, the greenhouse growers, they have these sticky cards they can put in the greenhouse, and the bugs stick to it, and you go in there and count the bugs and see what bugs are there, and you know what you have and what you need to spray. So some of these, uh, some of these homemade traps and, and uh, insect detection devices do work very well. Now these are the good uh, organic insecticides that you're going to see at the garden centers. And some of these are very, very good products. So here's horticultural oil. We all know what horticultural oil is, a very good contact insecticide. Neem oil. Neem oil has insecticidal properties and fungicidal properties, but actually neem oil is not as effective at killing insects and managing diseases as, as uh, on the insect management as these other products are. Spinosad is the um, most effective organic insecticide. Spinosad does a very good job on many, many insects. Um, mainly, you don't want to use spinosad for aphids. On aphids, seven and spinosad actually cause the aphid population to increase because you kill too many of the other insects that work on the aphids. So use something like eight 
or use something like horticultural oil to work on the aphids. But uh, spinosad is very good. And then this is BT, caterpillars, you know, takes care of the caterpillars and, and, and uh, those kind of things. So um, now, a recent home gardener told me that we spray horticultural oil to kill the bad bugs because it does not kill the good bugs. No, th this will kill good bugs too, so you need to realize that, okay? Now, they don't call this do-it-yourself pest. Um, um, now, now I can't remember what I was going to say. They actually called it a pest detergent. They actually call it a pest detergent, okay? And um, I, I think this is kind of silly. Uh, <laughs> an onion, garlic, mint leaves. This, this soap does work, but, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like you're preparing a recipe or something. I don't know. Uh, cayenne pepper. Uh, but you spray this and all your pest issues will be taken care of. You can deter pests with this pest detergent. So... But uh, this really, other than the soap, does not do very much, okay? Uh, a lot of the soaps do have good insect killing properties, but you need to saturate the plant and you don't want to burn the plant with the soap, so you got to be careful on that. Oh, okay, now the fire ants. Okay, now this is fun. There's more home remedies for fire ants than there is anything else, okay? What do y'all know of besides what's on this list here, okay? Of course, grits. Everybody talks about grits for your fire ants. You, you put your grits on your fire ant mound, and the fire ant eats the grits, the grits expand, and the ant blows up. I'm waiting to see a video of a fire ant exploding. Okay. Now, <laughs> another person says grits work, but you have to mix it with club soda. It doesn't work unless you mix it with club soda. Now, and then you have the wrestlemania for the ants. You take one shovel full of this mound and you put it on this mound. And you take a mound of ants from this mound and put it on this other mound. And that's wrestlemania for ants. And they kill each other. Okay. And then, of course, coffee grounds. And I've used coffee grounds on ant mounds. And I don't know whether it kills them or makes them move, you know. But uh, I've, I've used that. My mom and dad did that, you know. Uh, cornmeal, orange oil, furniture polish. I, I don't know where those are coming from. Neem oil will kill ants, but it's not poison. Okay, well. So you're killing, but you're not poisoning. Okay. I'm not sure if y'all got that. Okay. Tide. Tide will kill ants. Other detergents will kill ants. Then somebody else said, no, Tide is the only detergent that kills ants. <laughs> and then bleach, ginger ale. Now, in, <laughs> in, in Louisiana, somebody told me last week that Zataran shrimp and crab oil sprinkled on the mound will kill the ants. Well, they'll be spicy, but I don't know if they'll kill them. <laughs> and I'm saving that for the crawfish and shrimp and crabs, okay? Okay. I don't make this stuff up, y'all. This is what people say. Okay. Okay. Now, molasses. Molasses on your fire ant mound. Comet bathroom cleaner. Cinnamon. Boiling water. Okay. Mol 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 molten metal. Where do you get this? Where do you get it? Where do you get it? Powdered sugar, baking soda. Beer. So beer? I don't know, you know. I heard for beer for snails and slugs, but I haven't heard about beer for fire ants. Uh, soapy water, vinegar, borax, gas and kerosene. Now, my grandpa and I did use gas and kerosene, and we burned fire ant mounds in the pasture. You know, that was fun, you know? <laughs> but after mother had to call the LaRanger Fire Department twice, when we blew up the gas can, because we left a little trail of gas going from the fire ant mound, boom. And then my grandpa smoked cigarettes too while we're out here doing this, you know. Okay, okay. So, uh, 
and then the, the hot water, the, the crawfish pot water. So when we boil crawfish in south Louisiana, we're supposed to take the crawfish water and we pour on the, on the ant mound. Okay. All righty. Okay. What's that? Aged human urine. Okay. Okay. All righty. I heard that was a deer away kind of product too. Okay. 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 All righty. Okay. Okay. Now, it has to be aged. Okay. So here's a post on Louisiana Plants Facebook page. Can anyone recommend an organic weed ant killer for my garden? Now, my friend Jim Lestrapes in Opelousas, he owns a garden center. Come and get it. Come and get it. It has spinosad in it. It's a very good organic control for fire ants. So then Judith comes in. Now, Judith is a South Mississippi person, okay? Tied, mixed into a gravy, smothers them. <laughs> I have papers in my driveway. I went out one morning, and then coming out every crack, I'm four blocks from the bay, so I can't use toxin. So, but if this doesn't work, you call your agricultural extension service. <laughs> so at least she knows to, to call the county agent. Okay? Okay. I, w I was impressed with that. Okay. Now, if she was three blocks from the bay or five blocks from the bay, maybe she could use it. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. Now, this is what we ought to be doing, okay? How many fire ants do we have in our landscape or in our pasture? If we have 20 mounds per acre, we have a fire ant problem, okay? Texas A&M, the Texas Sioux Step method, okay? Individual mound treatments, so kill the mounds, and then you broadcast baits. You know, spring and fall, you want to broadcast baits especially around the perimeter of your yard. And that'll keep the fire ants from your neighbors coming onto your property. And after you do this two years, you darn eliminate your fire ants. There's neighborhood fire ant eradication programs. They're now really not ongoing much anymore. But um, in many cities, many subdivisions implemented this Texas Sioux Step method. And everybody in the neighborhood for 18 months did this method. Spring, mound treatment, and put the baits out. Fall, mound treatment, put the baits out. Next spring, mound treatment, put the baits out. And you're, you're fire ant free. And then once a year, once every 18 months, you put out some bait and you're good. It works. It really does. Now, a home gardener told me on Facebook... We live in the country, so the Texas Sioux Step method for fire ant control does not work because it just works in the cities. Okay. But there's a lot of great information on this on the Texas A&M website. Okay. Now, some ornamental silliness, okay? This is, this is a common thought that you have a red flowering rose planted to a pink, next to a pink flowering rose. Can the pink flowering rose become red and the red flowering rose become pink? No, that does not happen. Does not happen. <laughs> maybe, maybe they can, if they naturally graft it together, maybe, if the seed from one of those plants could become a non red rose or a non pink rose, but that rose is not going to, that's not going to happen. Okay? Now, another person told me that we cannot enjoy the flowers from a camellia because they bloom in the wintertime. <laughs> Seriously, okay. Now, I never thought about it, okay. <laughs> Do they not go outside in the winter? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, hardy hibiscus that come back every year as compared to tropical hibiscus that usually are not perennial due to winter temperatures. The hardy hibiscus can also be called frost-free hibiscus. So Jim Berry needs to develop, instead of selling his, um, now I can't think of the name of them, uh, he needs to call those frost-free hibiscus, okay? Frost-free hibiscus, okay? <laughs> 
Okay, banana for your rose bushes. Well, that's not silly. You can put bananas in your landscape beds and you get a little bit of beneficial nutrients out there, but it takes a whole lot of bananas, okay? One of the blueberry growers, Dave, told me we should never fertilize our blueberries. I don't know where that came from. Okay. Uh, righty? You must prune your plants to make them flower. No, that's not correct either. Okay? Now, the thing going on, on a couple weeks ago when we were diagnosing some problems is somebody said if you have a plant, plant that has brown leaves, that's called the brown leaf fungus. Okay. Now, here's another one. Did y'all know that, like on bell peppers, there's male and female chefalier plants? Okay? So the, the female chefalier is the variegated, and the male chefalier is the non variegated. No, that's not correct either. Okay. Okay. Okay, now let's get serious here. Now, this is the right way to plant a tree, this is the way you're supposed to do it, okay? Okay, so this is all fact right here, okay? A nice, nice container tree or bald and burlap tree. Um, pay attention to where the root flare is or the trunk flare between the trunk and the root system. Uh, you want to take the burlap off the top one-third of the root ball. You want to put two or three inches of mulch out there. <clears throat> You want to have the tree or shrub planted a little bit above the original soil level, okay? You want to have a wide planting hole. Nobody wants to make a wide planting hole. We need to make a planting hole two to three times the diameter of the root ball. And then we want the root ball on top of undisturbed soil. Some people dig down too deep. You want the same depth of the hole as the depth of the root ball, okay? All right, so that's the right way to plant a tree. And then you can stake or guy it if you need to, okay? Okay, now there's also the theory about gravel in the bottom of a container. The wettest soil in a container is at the bottom. So most people say that you put the gravel in there to help it drain but actually you're just moving the wettest part of the soil up in the pot and you're actually keeping the, the root system wetter. So we actually don't want to be doing this, okay? That's the current recommendation. Okay, I think we cut off a little bit of the top. So this is liriope or liriope or liriope or monkey grass or border grass. Okay, so, you know, Liriope is cheap, Liriope is expensive, okay. <laughs> okay, so there are some of the different ways to pronounce it, okay. Okay, so when you have hibiscus leaves that are yellow in the summer, this is called hibiscus decline disease. No, that's not hibiscus decline disease, that's just, you know, hi tropical hibiscus are prone to kind of going through some summer doldrums. Although tropical hibiscus summer, you think they're going to look beautiful all summer, but they love fertilizer. You don't have to put so much nitrogen on them, but they like potassium. And if you pot them and you don't fertilize them and you have them in too much sun in the summer, they will kind of have some leaf issues on them and they'll kind of go out of bloom. Tropical hibiscus, people think, are going to bloom for you April to first killing frost. And they will, but in the middle of the summer, down here, East Texas, Louisiana, we actually get a little bit too hot for tropical hibiscus, and you need to move them to a little bit of shade in the summertime, and they'll bloom better for you in the summertime if they're in a little bit of afternoon shade, okay? So fertilizer and location We'll clear that up pretty quickly. Okay, vitex trees. Everybody's got the beautiful vitex trees now. They're in bloom, and you know, every year when they start blooming, people want to know what they are, and, and they're lovely, and there's many new varieties. So these are vitex. Some people call them a chaste tree. 
So there was a lot of discussion on Facebook two weeks ago about what the right name is for these plants. Now some people call them the chaste tree instead of the chaste tree. Some people call them a butterfly bush, and I'm not opposed to that name, but Budlia is what's most normally called a butterfly bush, but you do have a lot of butterflies on Vitex. Uh, of course, the Texas Superstar program at A&M actually calls these Texas lilacs, but we all know they're not lilacs. Um, some people call these the purple tree. Some people call them a smoke tree, but there's another tree that's called the smoke tree. Somebody was talking about the Texas blue bonnet trees the other day. So the, I guess in some places in Texas, these are called the Texas blue bonnet trees. And, you know, okay. And then, and then if they're in Texas, they're called the Vitex tree. Okay, so anyway, that was the Vitex discussion from a couple of weeks ago. Okay. This is a new one called Delta Blues. Delta Blues is a fabulous new Vitex tree, smaller growing and just a different flower color and a really nice blue. Dawn and Dr. Creech have some planted in the, uh, in the Woody Ornamental Trial Garden here, and they're, they're very, very nice. Delta Blues. I like it. Okay. Somebody said last week or two weeks ago, agapanthus grow too well and they take over flower beds. So we don't want to plant agapanthus because they're invasive. People are using the term invasive now for good growing ornamental plants, or it seems like they are, you know. So there are invasive plants, but we need to not be putting this spreading, happy, ornamental plant in the same sentence as invasive. It just grows well, it does good. And there are certainly agapanthus plantings that don't do good too. So anyway, this person just does not think they should be planted because they take over flower beds and they get too big and they grow too well. While well, all of us want ornamental plants to grow too well, we want them to do good, or at least I hope we want them to do good. So anyway. Okay, and then the uh, hydrangeas, okay. Uh, I don't think I listed, well maybe I did, but anyway, you know, this time of year there's always a lot of discussion about hydrangeas and garden hydrangeas. You have blue flowers or you have pink flowers and do you have acid soil or do you have alkaline soil? Do you have a pink flower and you want it to be blue or you have a blue flower and you want it to be pink or your flowers are in between and don't know what kind of color they want to, uh, they want to be? So, okay, so some people say that if you put Sprite or a lemon lime cola on your hydrangeas that they will change color. Okay, And then, of course, the rusty nails, and I've heard rusty nails my whole life, and it probably works, but I don't really know. Epsom salt has nothing to do with color change on hydrangeas, and, and Epsom salt doesn't change, doesn't change pH. But put Epsom salt out, and it'll do something. Okay, Gin trash, well, I don't know what the gin, tr gin trash theory is. Gin trash usually has a pH of about 6.8 something like that, you know, so uh, railroad spikes, um, nitrogen, nitrogen has nothing to do with it, you know, and some people said, well, you know, we just need to go ask the folks at Lowe's because they know. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, the folks at Lowe's probably do not know. Okay, okay. So I know this is small print here. Okay, so are your hydrangeas pink and you want them to be blue? Are your hydrangeas blue and you want them to be pink? Are your hydrangeas a confused color somewhere in between? So basically, you need to lower your pH, simply said, lower your pH to get blue flowers, raise your pH to get pink flowers. And it takes several growing seasons to do this. You're not going to, you know, if you start right now for next year, you may make a little bit of progress, but it usually takes a couple of growing seasons to get this transition over. It just depends on what your aluminum is in the soil, and it depends on what your current pH status is right now. So it may, uh, it may uh, vary. Now, some people think your white hydrangeas can go blue or your white hydrangeas can go pink, but that's not the case, okay? So, so this is for the pink and the blue ones, okay? So lime to raise your pH, 
aluminum sulfate, ammonium sulfate, elemental sulfur to lower your pH. And this will take a couple of years to do that. Uh, but also there's some genetics involved in this. There's, there's a variety of differences involved in this. Um, your best performance on your hydrangeas, you really need to fertilize your hydrangeas every year in early spring. Hydrangeas are very dependent on fertilizer for good landscape performance. So they're dependent on good soil nutrients for landscape performance. So be sure to uh, annually fertilize or know what your soil nutrients are. Um, now, there's a new endless summer variety now this year called Summer Crush, and it has red flowers and acid soil, and it becomes more purplish flowers and alkaline soil. So, you, you know, this is not blue or pink. This kind of goes red and purple. So you do have instances on hydrangeas besides blue and pink where you do have this, uh, this flower color change that you can, uh, that you can implement. Okay, so I'm getting toward the end here. Appreciate y'all listening to me and tolerating me. And uh, we want to keep planting. We want to remember that if you cannot plant your flowers if you're not bought any. Botany, botany, bought any, okay. We don't want to guess, we want a soil test. We want to stop the crap and save the crepes. We want to just plant something. Now I'm at LSU, this is how we spell grow, go and grow at LSU. Go, grow, okay. We want to have green side up. We never want to be caught with our plants down. And whether you overwater your plants or whether you underwater your plants, once they're dead, they all look the same. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you all. Who, who's got some questions or who wants to uh, be mad at me or who has some more uh, remedies that we need to talk about. I know we've got more. <laughs> I had a remedy uh, yes. a few years ago. We had a huge squirrel attack and we went out and tamed our Japanese maples with polyurethane branches and trunks and high insanity hot sauce mixed in that we got it in the end. And I think it worked. Yes, sir. No. no. A cayenne hot sauce has worked in some situations like that. Yes, sir. Your uh, information about the, the Texas two-step for fire ants. Yes. That works over an area. Uh huh. That it doesn't matter whether it's in the city or in the country. Right. Right. But you got to do it over a big area. Yes, sir. To get control because the fire ants. After a rain, typically, they, the males and females go like 100 or 200 feet up in the air right, right, to mate. Right. And then the wind blows them and they drift down. Those females go down and start new nests. Yes, sir. So they're always moving with the wind yes. uh, all summer long. And that's why the nest after nest, even though you're going to treat them. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, okay. Uh, Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Does the pine straw have any concerns about upsetting the pH around your plants? Okay, pine straw. So pine straw is acid. Pine straw is 4.5 to 4.8 on a soil pH meter. So when your mulch degrades in your bed, you are going to have an, or, an organic layer of mulch or an organic layer of the broken down mulch on top of your soil or on top of your landscape bed soil that's in your bed. So you can have a layer of mulch, a layer of organic matter there that is one pH, a landscape bed soil down there that's another pH, the, the soil in the bed at the bottom could be another pH. So you can have layers of that occurring, right? So, so fortunately, most of our ornamental plants like to have a pH Acid, most of them 6.0 to 6.5, and then your acid-loving plants 5 to 5.5. 5. So I have not noticed a pH issue using pine straw, but we do grow a lot of acid plants. So, yes, ma'am. What do you know about the millipedes, the little tiny worms with all the legs that are just... Millipede, millipedes and centipedes. It seemed like there was an explosion of them this spring. Mm -hmm. And I am not sure what the best control situation is on that. And I don't remember what I read on why they're so bad this spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
condemnation for getting rid of crawdads because I've had about 10 million, you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. So, so your crawfish mounds in your lawn, your crawfish mounds in your lawn, of course, indicate, you know, wet soil, and um, it's not labeled, it's not labeled, but you can put like a teaspoon of, of seven dust down the hole and put some water down there, and that works. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh-huh. You have, a preferred, you have a preferred beer for slugs? The cheap, the cheap beer. <laughs> cheap, stale beer. Okay. Yes, sir. I heard that you can use fire ant poison for crawfish. I, I've heard fire ant poison too for crawfish, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, a bait, a bait is a attractant. It has an attractant on it, and that is more to get the the uh, bait carried down to the queen, where the queen will be killed. You know, but so the product, right there's yes, there's there, there's there's different there's different active ingredients, and some of those are more bait products, and some of those are or more contact kill or work in some other way. Right, right, yeah, yeah. I'm not enough of an entomologist to exactly explain it to you. Yes? You put the, uh, the, the first step down to get rid of the mounds, and then you put the bait down yes, sir. to uh, maintain it. Right, okay. Those new ones that are dropping in. Right, right. And how do you get rid of the Okay, horti horticultural oil and uh, probably horticultural oil is the best thing for aphids. It really is. Uh huh. Yes. 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 Well, you know, a, a, a small population, a small population. You can just get your your garden hose and and put your nozzle on your garden hose and just physically spray them off. Yes. Uh, uh, and that and and that works very good. Uh, they come back. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you get rid of moles and vo moles and voles? And 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 what's the other one? Skews, screws, shrews, shrews, mole. Yeah, uh, cats, cats. And there's also a, a trap that you can put at the end of the tunnels, and it kind of decapitates them. Uh huh. And that hasn't worked either. And it seems like. There's more moles and voles out there than there used to be, or at least more people are asking about them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Eating the roots or damaging the roots when they tunnel through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Alan. Yes, sir.